On January 7th, 1973, a sniper made his way to the top of the Howard Johnson Hotel in downtown New Orleans and began opening fire. Unwilling to sit by and watch this tragedy unfold, a U.S. Marine pilot took it upon himself to steal a helicopter and risk breaking all the rules in order to help save the city, but he never expected that the military would want to court-martial him. I'm Hoover, and welcome to your pilot debrief. Lieutenant General Charles Chuck Pittman is the pilot, and he's the hero of our story. This guy was a legend. At the time of this awful tragedy, Chuck had flown over 1,200 combat missions in Vietnam, mainly flying CH-46s, but he also flew the CH-53, the UH-1, the AH-1, and the OV-10. He was shot down seven times, and on the last time he was shot down, he was hit in the leg by a 50 caliber bullet and sent back to the States to recover in New Orleans where he was assigned to a reserve training unit, not realizing that his days of being shot at in a helicopter weren't over just yet. We're gonna take a much closer look at his flying skills and hear him tell the story in his own words in just a minute. But first, we need to talk about the villain of our story, and that's Mark Essex. This guy joined the Navy in 1969, where he initially performed pretty well, but over time he grew frustrated with the way black sailors were being treated, and after just about a year and a half, he was essentially radicalized and eventually went AWOL. And in 1971, he was given a discharge from the Navy for general unsuitability. Almost two years later, his family thought he had moved on from his past, but the truth was that he was battling severe depression and he had purchased a Ruger Model 44 semi-automatic rifle and a Colt 38 revolver, and he had plans to use them. To understand how Lieutenant General Pittman became involved in the story, we begin on November 29th, 1972, when he was just Lieutenant Colonel Pittman and tragedy struck New Orleans. Chuck Pittman was the commanding officer of a Marine Reserve Training Unit at Bell Chase, which had CH-46 helicopters. On that terrible day, a fire broke out on the 16th floor of a high-rise building downtown. Now, a group of people found themselves trapped on the 17th floor, and the fire department couldn't reach them. So five individuals decided to jump rather than burn alive. Only one survived the fall. Eight others made it up to the roof, where they were rescued by a helicopter just moments before the roof collapsed. Hold on though, because this helicopter wasn't flown by Chuck Pittman. However, the city recognized that they needed better coordination to prevent another tragedy like this, and that's why they met with Chuck, along with representatives from the Coast Guard, to figure out how they could all help. Now, even though Chuck's unit had some rescue capabilities, he had a few big concerns. And we, we said, well, you know, how are we gonna resolve this? So one of the problems is if you try and help somebody and he, they slip and fall and kill themselves trying to get on your helicopter. Well, that's not going to go very well either. As a pilot, Chuck knew that you're always responsible for the safety of those on board your aircraft. And sometimes that means letting someone else do the job and not let your pride get in the way. Listen to what he said. So we decided that the Coast Guard, who had trained medics on their plane and had all kinds of different capabilities, automatic cover, uh, better navigation systems and so forth. They would be the first responders. This is important to know because even though Chuck has a ton of experience and he could probably very easily handle any sort of stressful situation that he might encounter in New Orleans, he knew the Coast Guard was better suited for this kind of job, but keep that in mind because it's gonna be relevant later on in the story. For now, it's important to know that just because you have a lot of hours or experience, that doesn't mean you won't be involved in an aviation mishap. The difference between Chuck and a lot of the pilots that I talk about in my other debriefs on this channel is that Chuck was able to put his ego aside. And I'm sure that when the meeting with the city was over, Chuck probably figured that was the last that he'd hear from them now that the Coast Guard was on call, but about a month later, he'd be wrong. On New Year's Eve, 1972, Chuck was probably celebrating like most people. Meanwhile, our villain, Mark Essex, had reached a breaking point and he made up his mind that he wanted to kill white people, specifically white police officers. So he made his way to the police station in town where he hid behind some parked cars and opened fire. He wounded one officer and he killed a 19-year-old police cadet who ironically was black. Essex escaped and later that evening he ambushed two more officers shooting one in the back. That officer would tragically die just a few months later. 30 armed police officers arrived within minutes, but Essex had already escaped again. For an entire week, the city was on edge and Mark Essex was nowhere to be found. 
On the morning of January 7th, 1973, just before 11 a.m., Mark Essex carjacked somebody and then drove over to the Howard Johnson Hotel downtown. He gained access to the hotel through the fire escape and carrying his rifle, he made his way to the top floor where he murdered a newlywed couple and he also shot and killed the hotel's assistant manager and the general manager as he continued to make his way through the hotel, setting fire to some of the rooms. As police and fire rescue personnel arrived, they fell right into his trap. Essex opened fire, wounding and killing others as he made his way back to the rooftop where he took cover in a concrete cubicle. The whole scene was in chaos as the sniper's strategic positioning on the rooftop turned the hotel into a battleground, rendering ground operations by the police almost ineffective. Not to mention that the firemen couldn't put out the blaze because they were being shot at too. This goes on for hours and hours as police fire thousands of rounds at Essex. The police even tried putting their own snipers on nearby buildings, but they couldn't get a clear shot and they weren't able to storm the roof to eliminate the threat. In comes Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Pittman. He was out for a jog that day and he had no idea what was going on until some of the Marines in his unit told him about the situation. He figured the Coast Guard would be helping the police and he wanted to help too, so he immediately ordered two of his best Marine marksmen to head over to the Coast Guard unit in order to help protect their helicopter, but listen to what happened next. The weather was below minimums and so forth, so I'm sitting there waiting for the Coast Guard to show up and uh, they don't show up. And after about an hour and a half, I, two, the two marksmen came back I said, where are you? What have you been doing? What's going on? I said, the Coast Guard's not going to go. The weather's too bad. That's right. The weather was too bad for the Coast Guard to fly. Now, I'm not blaming them because maybe their pilots didn't have the experience that Chuck Pittman had, or maybe they thought they couldn't safely execute the mission. Either way, Essex was still taking shots and raining terror down from above on the rooftop, and then he would retreat back to his hiding spot. That's when Chuck decided enough was enough and regardless of the weather, he needed to do something. The problem is, even though he had a few CH-46 helicopters available, Chuck knew better than to try to call and get permission because the Marine Corps would have gladly reminded him that those helicopters don't belong to him. So he can't just take them and go do whatever he wants. So that's why instead of asking his boss, he just took a helicopter and off he went, figuring he would just ask for forgiveness later. When Pittman's son was interviewed later in life, he said regarding his dad, the thing with him was, if you're gonna be a Marine, you've gotta do what you've gotta do. The question was, with near zero visibility, how was Chuck going to get from the airfield at Bell Chase over to the Howard Johnson Hotel downtown, and what was he going to do when he got there? So that's when Chuck came up with a plan, and he knew exactly what he needed to do and the risk involved. Well, I lived on the river, or right along the river, along the levee, actually. So I knew the river pretty well, and that's the best way to town from, from this base. So all I had to do was make it a few blocks to the river, I have an airplane that will float in the river for a short period of time, and uh, off we went. And we flew down the, up the river, and as we went up, we were going by ships that were anchored in the river, and they were looking down at us as we went by. And we got to the Mississippi River Bridge, and we pulled up. I could see the lights in the haze and fog overhead, so we pulled up there and uh, took the interstate, interstate right off the bridge, second right, and a couple of different blocks. So we landed there behind City Hall, so, but the gunfire was going over overhead, and our people were shooting, and somebody was shooting back on occasion. So it was just uh, really a, quite a mess. This was obviously a very risky decision. He didn't have to order people to fly with him. They went along as volunteers knowing the risk, but trusting Chuck to keep them safe. That's because in addition to his multiple tours in Vietnam, he was awarded the Silver Star, four Distinguished Flying Crosses, the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, and 65 Air Medals. And what you also probably don't know about Chuck is that after all of this was over, he would end up flying pretty much every single type of aircraft the Marines had, his mantra was always fly, fly, fly. And that's exactly what he did during his career and on that fateful day in New Orleans. After he landed near City Hall, he talked to the police chief who suggested that he use his helicopter to lift the police department's armored vehicle up onto the roof. 
but Chuck told him that probably wasn't a good idea since that weighed more than what his helicopter could carry, besides the fact that it would probably collapse and fall through the roof anyways. Eventually, they came to the agreement that some police sharpshooters would hop on board and Chuck would get them in a position to observe and eliminate the threat. Now, what happened next was a master class in tactical flying under extreme pressure. For hours and hours, Chuck piloted his CH-46 around the hotel, demonstrating extraordinary skill and patience. His ability to keep the helicopter stable while under fire was crucial. Each pass over the rooftop required precision flying, as Pittman had to balance the need to provide a stable shooting platform for the officers on board, with the necessity of evasive maneuvers to avoid being shot by Essex, and oh by the way, he had all the weather to deal with too. Every time Chuck would turn to fly away in order to reposition, Essex would pop out of his hole and take shots at the helicopter, but Chuck wasn't ready to give up no matter how long it took. They'd run out of ammo and he'd go land and they'd reload and then they'd go right back up. He did this multiple times over the course of the afternoon and into the early evening. Chuck knew that at some point he wasn't going to have enough fuel to return back to base, but he continued to support the mission knowing that he would just ask for a fuel truck the next day to come to him. As it grew dark outside, one of Chuck's most notable tactics was the use of the helicopter searchlight. By illuminating Essex's position, he denied the sniper the cover of darkness and disoriented him, significantly aiding the officers in targeting Essex. But this was probably the toughest part of the mission because by now it's almost 9 p.m. and I'm going to let Chuck explain how he was finally able to bring the conflict to an end. So I had to run the searchlight and, and fly the airplane and all of that, which is pretty easy normally. But because the weather was so bad, you couldn't see where the, aim, where the searchlight was looking. So we'd had to get up to the building, then we'd adjust the searchlight and it'd be fine. But he realized there were a few seconds in there where we didn't have any light on him. So he came running out and I saw him just visually. And he was wearing dark clothes and he came out. And uh, so I rushed the helicopter down and crushed a few antennas on the roof. And, and uh, Tony, the guy fired a, his shot. He had a shotgun with slugs for whatever reason. <laughs> And he hit behind him, got him in the back. So he came out shooting. And everybody opened up from all the buildings and our guys. And after about 200 rounds or so, I figured I probably got him. This brings us to probably the most interesting part of the story. Now, you'd think that the Marine Corps would take one look at Chuck and give him a medal and turn him and his helicopter into a giant recruiting poster. But of course they didn't. And instead, they started the process of a court martial. Thankfully, Ed Herbert, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, called up the Secretary of Defense and said, leave my boy alone, and the matter was dropped. Now, I know this wasn't your typical pilot debrief covering an aviation mishap, but I felt it was time to tell a story about a pilot that broke the rules and actually saved lives. And if you enjoyed this video, then you'll probably like this other one on the screen, and I'll see you next time.